Good day, students. You are welcome to your favorite YouTube channel, Physics for Everybody. Today, we'll be solving questions on the 2023 February March IGCSC Physics 0625 examination. Take note that the 2023 February March result was released just today, this morning, and this question paper was released this morning. So you will be the first person to see this video if you are viewing it today. So this is the core paper and I will go straight to solving question number one. Stay tuned. The extended paper will be released tomorrow. All right, so let's go. This is question number one. Let me erase all of these I've written so you can have the question brand new. So question number one. The measuring cylinder contains water. The diagrams show the measuring cylinder before and after some of the water is poured into a beaker. How much water has been poured into the beaker? So this was the volume of water before pouring into the beaker. And um, this shows the volume of water after pouring into the beaker. What value do we have here? Okay, okay. since um, between 0 and 25, we have 5 divisions. 25 divided by 5 is 5. 25 divided by 5 equals to 5, okay? Why did I divide by 5? The reason why I divided by 5 is because we have 5 division between 0 and 25. So, this means each division is 5 units. So, we go 5, 10, 15, 20, 25. So, this is 50, 75, 100. Each division, each small division is 5 units. 100, 105, 110, 115. So we have 115 minus, minus what we have here. What do we have here? Um, what value do we have here? This is um, 25, 50, 55, 60. This is 60. 115 minus 60. 115 minus 60. This is 60. And 115 minus 60 gives us what? This gives us 55, 55. So that is the answer. So we pick the answer that gives us 55 here. 55 centimeter cube, option C. Do not forget that the measuring cylinder is calibrated in cm cube. Let's go straight to question number two. How much water, sorry, question number two. The diagram shows the speed time graph for a car. Which road describes the motion of the car at point X and at point Y? At point X, you can see this axis gives us speed and this axis gives us time. The rate of change of speed with time gives us acceleration. And because this is a straight line, it means you have uniform acceleration, okay? Or you see the speed is increasing at a uniform rate. And that is what we have at C here. This is correct. And this is correct. It is moving with changing speed. The speed is changing along x. That's correct. Now at y, you can see the speed is constant from here. That's how you have this horizontal line here. It shows constant speed. Okay, good. And where do we have that? We have that here. Y, we have moving at constant speed. And we have that here. Okay. This is not correct. The object is not at rest because this shows speed, constant speed. If it was distance against time, then this horizontal line means it is at rest. So which line gives us two correct answers? Option D. It, it is at option D that both statements are correct. So D is the correct answer to question number two. Let's go straight to question three. A ball is dropped in a vacuum from a height of 4.0 meters above the surface of Mars. The acceleration of the ball at height of 2 meters is 38 meters per second squared. What is the acceleration of the ball at the height of 1 meter above the surface of mass? How, what is the formula for calculating acceleration? The formula for acceleration, the formula for acceleration is change in speed divided by time. But do we need that here? No. Now, we are given that at the height of 4 meters, the acceleration of the ball, sorry, Okay, yeah. So, acceleration of the ball at a height of 2 meters is 3.8 meters per second square. Now, the question is requesting for the acceleration of the ball at a height of 1 meters. 
Do you understand it? This formula does, is not necessary. So what do you do? If something is accelerating at 2 meters per second, at um, 3.8 meters per second square, at the height of 2 meters, then what happens when the ball reaches a height of 1 meters above the surface? Something is at the surface, acceleration downwards is 3.8 meters per second square. Just, I want you to liken this with the acceleration due to gravity on the surface of the Earth. You know very well that acceleration due to gravity at the surface of the Earth is 10 meters per second square. And it does not depend, it does not vary that much with little change in height. You always take it as approximately 10 meters per second square. So if at the height of um, 2 meters, acceleration is 3.8 meters per second square, then when the height reduces to 1 meters, it will still be 3.8 meters per second square. Okay, because there is insignificant change in distance. So it's still considered to be um, close to the surface of the planet. So it does not change with that tiny change in distance. So our acceleration remains 3.8 meters per second square. Let's go to question four. Two objects are placed on a balance, one on one side, as shown. Which properties of the objects can be compared using the balance? You know, when you are having a balance, it works based on the principle of moment. The clockwise moments should be equal to anticlockwise moments for the object to be in equilibrium. Okay? And we always co compare the mass of the objects here with the mass of the objects here. Okay? Or we compare the weight of the objects here with the weight of the objects here using the formula F1D1 equal to F2D2. We don't really need this, but the point is that we need the force. We compare the forces and the distances, okay? Or you compare the weights and the distances, or the masses and the distances. This does not give us the volume because there's no measuring cylinder or there's no mention of length, breadth, and height. So anything that involves volume is not part of our answer in this case. Now let's look at our option. Option A says weight, mass, volume. No, you can't use this for volume. Option B says weight and mass only. Well, that is correct because you can use it to compare weight and mass. Option C, volume. No, we can't use this for volume. Option D, density only. No, you can't use it for density. Why? Because density is mass divided by volume. And this object has no relationship with density. Hence, only option B is correct. And we shade option B as the correct answer. Let's move straight to question number four. Question number five. A rectangular swimming pool is 50 meters long and 25 meters wide. It contains water at a depth of it contains water at a depth of two meters. The density of water is 1,000 kilograms per meter cube. What is the mass of water? We use the formula for calculating density. Density equal to mass divided by volume. What is the mass in this case? You have um, the question request for the mass. So you can introduce a denominator of one. After introducing a denominator of one, what you do, you cross multiply. So let us cross multiply. We multiply m by one, and then you multiply density by volume. So when you do that, what you get? You get m times one gives us m. That means the mass is density multiplied by volume. What's the density of water? You already have the density of water as 1,000 kilograms per meter cube. Now, what we need is volume. What's the volume? Since it is a, is a rectangular swimming pool, then we use the formula for volume of a, of a cuboid. That will be length times breadth times height, okay? Or you say length times breadth times width. Let me finish it here. So the volume is, let's multiply the length, which is 50 meters, by the breadth, which is 25 meters, by the height, which is 2 meters. This gives us 2,500 meter cube now we can use the formula dense we can use the formula mass equal to density times volume this is the formula i'm picking mass is density multiplied by volume what is our mass our mass is our density multiplied by the volume what is density the density is 1000 kilogram per meter cube what is the volume the volume is this 25000 that we got here 25 sorry 2500 meter cube. So if you multiply 2,500 by 1,000, you get 2,500,000 kilogram. That is the mass of the, of the water. And that is what we have here, 2,500,000 kilogram. We go straight to question number six. 
Question number six is an object. Let me make sure. Okay, question number six says an object is rising vertically at constant speed through water. There are three vertical forces acting on it the weight W, the drag force D, and the upward force U. That the upward force U. Which diagram shows the magnitude and the direction of the vertical forces acting on the object? Do not forget that the question says the object is rising vertically upward. That means the up, up thrust, that is the upward force is the up thrust. The up thrust must be greater than the weight and the drag. Okay, And do not forget that if something is moving this way, then that thing must be opposing the force of drag. Hence, drag must be in the opposite direction to the direction of motion, okay? That means drag must be in the opposite direction, which is downward. Also, the weight will always be downward. So weight will be downward, drag will be downward, while up thrust will be upward. So where do we have that? I think um, option D is the only option that gives us that. Question six, option D, that's where we have up, up thrust acting upward, while drag and weight act downward. So we select option D for question number six. Question seven. Which force produces heating during contact with moving objects? Weight friction. Of course, it's only friction that produces um, heating. Friction causes heat when there's relative motion between two surfaces in contact. Question 8. A metal roll is balanced at its midpoint. A metal roll is balanced at its midpoint. It remains balanced when 3 Newton load is hung from the 40 cm mark and a second load hung from the 80 cm mark. So we hang a 3 Newton load from the 40 cm mark. So if this is the 40 cm mark, you know this zero, and you are told that um, it balances at the midpoint, which is 50. This is the 50 cm mark. You know what the uniform metal rule is. So when you balance it at the midpoint, if this is 40 cm mark, this is 50 cm mark, then what's the distance here? Because moment is force times distance. What distance do we have on the left hand side? It will be 50 minus 40, which is 10. Okay, let's go to the right hand side. What do you have on the right hand side? A load is sorry, a load, a 3 newton load is hung on the 50 cm mark, and a second load is hung from the 80 cm mark. So let this be our 80 cm mark. This is 80 cm mark, and then we have a second load. Let's call that load L. Okay, or we just call it our F2, yeah. Okay, that's the force F2. And what's the distance? The distance here, that will be 80 minus 50. So let us put our value. Okay, so what's the next thing? The next question, the next question, the question says, what is the weight of the second load? So F2, that's the weight of the second load. That's what we are looking for. Now let us pick our values from the question. From here, the distance from 50 to 40 will be 10 centimeters. That will be 50 minus 40. So the distance here is 10 centimeters. And here, the distance between the force here and the pivot, okay, is 30. How did I get 30? 80 minus 50 gives us 30. That's the distance D2. Now we use the formula for calculating moment. Um, the force F1D1 must be equal to F2D2. What is F1? F1. F1 is the weight you apply here, which is 3 Newton. 3 multiplied by what's B1? B1 is the distance between this force and the pivot. That's the force, that's the distance between the force and the pivot. And that's what causes the anticlockwise moment. So that distance is 10 centimeters. So multiplying these two must give you the same answer as multiplying the other two here. That's what makes it balanced. Okay, do not forget that they say it remains balanced. So for it to remain balanced, this product must give us the same answer, which is 30 multiplied by F2. So F2 is the force and the distance is 30. So let's see, 3 times 10 gives us 30 is equal to F2 times 30 gives us 30 F2. If 30 F2 is equal to 30, what do you think F2 will be? Just divide both sides by 30. Divide both sides by 30. Therefore, you have um, 1 is equal to F2, okay? Or you say F2 is equal to 1 Newton. And that makes option A the correct answer to this question. So let me bring my blue ink and select option A. Let's go straight to question nine. 
A student measures the length of a spring. She then attaches different weights to the spring. She measures the length of the spring for each weight. The table shows her result. So these are the weights and these are the lengths of the spring. So as they are increasing the weight, the length of the spring is increasing. What is the extension of the spring when the weight, when the weight of 3 newton is attached? So at this point, when you attach a weight of 3 newton, what will be the extension? Do not forget that extension is difference in length or change in length. That's what we mean by extension. And the weight, when the weight is zero, when no load is attached, the length here is called L0. That's the, your original length. And the formula for extension is the, the length in question, okay? Let's say the length when the force is 3 newton minus the length when no force is applied. What's the length when the force is 3 newton? That's probably than 33 meters. That's probably than 33 meters, okay? So this length minus L0, the original length, the length when no load is applied, which is probably than 20 millimeters, please. Millimeter, that's the unit of length here. 530 millimeters minus 520 millimeters. What would that give you? 530 minus 520 will give us 13 millimeters. And that is option D. That makes option D the correct answer to question 9. Question 10. Which power station produces the greatest atmospheric pollution for each unit of energy generated? Number one, gas fired power station, hydroelectric power station. Nuclear power station, wind firm. Of course, you know very well that gas power power station produces the greatest um, air pollution. Yes, gas. You use um, natural gas, crude oil. They produce um, much pollution. Wind is very clean. Nuclear power station does not pollute the wind as much as um, gas does. If 5 newton weight is raised to a height of 5 cm, how much work is done by the force? The formula for work is that work is equal to force multiplied by distance. You know here, the force is 500 newton, right? Good. And what's the distance? The distance is 5 cm. But in physics, we don't use centimeters. We use meters for our distance. So how do you convert from centimeter to meter? You divide by 100. Okay, 5 divided by 100 gives us 0 0.05. Hence, our distance is 0 0.05 meters. Now, let us calculate the work done using this formula, force times distance. What is the force? The force is 500 newton. What is the distance? The distance is 0 0.05 meters. 5 multiplied by 0 0.05. That will give us 25 joules. That makes option A the correct answer to question 11. Question 12. The diagram shows a rectangular block of weight 16 newton. It is resting on a flat surface. What is the pressure at the base of the What is the pressure at the base of the block due to its weight? Do not forget that the SI unit given here is newton per centimeter square. So the and the, and the formula for pressure pressure is equal to force divided by area, where the force is the weight. Okay. And the area is the cross-sectional area of the base of this shape. This base, the area of this base, that's the area we are talking about, okay? What's the formula for... Okay, so let's start with the force. What's the force? The force is 16 newton. It's given to us in the question. The weight is, is the force, and 16 newton. What's the area? We have to get the area by multiplying the length by the breadth. What's the length? The length is 4 centimeters. Okay, let me erase this so the length can be clearly seen. The length is 4 centimeters and the breadth is 5 centimeters, okay? And those are the same values you have here. 4 centimeters, 5 centimeters this way, okay? So that will be 4 centimeters multiplied by 5 centimeters. That gives us 20 centimeter squared. The SI unit of, of area would be centimeter square in this case, okay? Good. So I'll put that down and then I'll go and calculate the, the pressure. So let's go. Pressure is force divided by area. Our force is 16 newton. So I put that here. Our area is 20 cm squared. So I put that here. 16 divided by 20 will give us 0 
newton per centimeter square. That makes option C the correct answer to question 13. Now, question 14. A piston traps a mass of gas inside a cylinder. Initially, the piston is halfway along the length of the cylinder. The piston is now moved towards the open end of the cylinder. The temperature of the gas remains constant. How are the density and pressure of the gas affected by, by moving the piston? Okay, so how are the density and pressures? If temperature remains constant, by pulling this piston backwards, you create more space for the gas. So as you are creating more space, that means the distance between each of the molecules will increase. Okay, that means as the gas is occupying more space, then the density will reduce. Also, the pressure will reduce. Why is the density reducing? Because density is mass over volume, okay? And if volume is increasing, that means as you are pulling this backwards, volume is increasing. So as volume is increasing, as the denominator of a fraction is increasing, the value of that whole fraction will reduce, okay? So if volume is increasing, then pressure, the density rather, density will reduce. And as density is reducing, pressure will also reduce. Why? Because pressure is density times gravity times height, okay? Of course, you don't need this mathematical relationship. Common analogy would let you know that both density and pressure will reduce as you are increasing the volume of the gas, okay? As long as the mass remains constant, increasing the volume will reduce the pressure. Let's go straight to question 15. Which statement describes what happens in air particles when the air is heated? A, the particles move more slowly. No, the particles move more quickly. Yes, as you are increasing temperature, the particles move more quickly. Why? Because um, temperature is related to the average kinetic energy of the particles of a substance. And kinetic energy is half mv squared. So increasing the kinetic energy means you are increasing the speed of the particle and they move more quickly. They move more vigorously, more violently. What happens, question 16, what happens when the temperature of a liquid increases? When you increase the temperature of a liquid, what happens? The mass of the liquid increases. No, mass remains constant. Mass of liquid increases. No, no, mass remains constant. Volume of liquid increases. That's correct. Expansion will take place, making the liquid less dense. That's correct. Let's see the next one. Volume of liquid increases, making the liquid more dense. No, the liquid becomes less dense. As you are increasing volume, then the liquid becomes less dense. Question 17. In which states of matter can thermal energy be transferred by convection? Convection only happens in liquid and gases. Okay, as for solid, all we have is conduction. So let's see liquid and solid, gases and liquid only. Yes, gases and liquid only. Question 18. A transverse wave moves along a rope. The diagram shows the position of the rope at one particular time. This is the position of the rope. Which two label points are one wavelength apart? Okay, when do we have one complete cycle? Um, let's say, you know, a full cycle is something like this, okay? Or you say something like this. Just a situation whereby if you add two halves together, you have a full cycle, okay? Yeah, even something like this is considered to be a full cycle, okay? Because if you add these, these four halves together, okay, if you have them, this diagram is not um, good enough, so let me not use this. Something like this, something like this is considered to be a full cycle, yeah, because if you add them, um, these four quarters together, one, two, three, four, if you add those four quarters together, you get a full cycle. So when do you have a full cycle here? In this case, the only place where you have a full cycle is like this, from X to Z. That's a full cycle. Hence, we select option C, from X to Z. Question 19. The diagram shows a ray of light being reflected from a plane mirror. Which row identifies the angle of incidence and angle of reflection? Of course, if this is the incidence ray, then this will be your angle of incidence, and this will be your angle of reflection. So X is your angle of incidence and y is the angle of reflection option a is the correct answer to question 19. question 20 
Blue light has a typical wavelength of 5 times 10 to the power minus 7 meters and frequency of 5.0 times 10 to the power 15 hertz, which will give the typical frequency of red light. Um, do not forget that the, um, the electromagnetic spectrum for visible light is red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. So, red light has a um, lower frequency lower frequency than blue light. Blue light has higher frequency. Good. So now we have the frequency of um, blue light, right? If this frequency of blue light, then the frequency of um, red light should be lower than this value. So when do we have frequency lower than this value? Um, these two cases, these two frequencies are lower than what we have here. Also, if the frequency of um, if the frequency of red light is lower than that of blue light, that means the wavelength of red light will be higher than the wavelength we have here. When do we have wavelengths that are higher than what we have here? These two cases. But do not forget that the visible portion of light, um, the, the frequencies are very close to each other. This one seems too far from this, but this is close enough to what we have here. Hence, we select option C. Okay, the frequencies are very close. The frequency for visible light, they are very close to each other. So you don't pick this one that is a bit far away. So um, in this case, um, memorizing it is not necessary. You just have to analyze the situation and pick options that are close to your answer. And if you Google it, the frequencies of, um, of red light, frequency of blue light, you get those values. Which diagram shows what happens when a ray of white light passes through a prism? There will be what? There will be dispersion of white light. White light will spread into these various components. And what are those various components? These are the various components. Red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. And that's what we have here. Okay? White light going in, it will split from, in, immediately it enters, it splits. So it's not splitting, immediately it enters here. And here, the deflection is away from the normal. No? Okay, here, it's into the normal here. Then here, it is away from the normal. No, it's not working that way. It will be into the normal twice. So white light comes in, it will be dispersed close to the normal. And I'm getting here, it will be dispersed closer. It will be dispersed further away from the normal here. Yeah, sorry, away from the normal here. Good. So that is what we have here. Option D is the correct answer. Question 22. Question 22 now. A television station transmits a signal to a television receiving dish. The television has an on-off indicator light. So this is the on-off indication light. This is the television. This is the receiving dish of the television. This is the television station. It sends signal to the satellite, and then the satellite sends the signal to the receiving dish. So when the television receives signal, then there will be an indicator light that you can see, okay? And this is the remote control that controls the television. The television is switched on by a remote control, which changes the indicator light from red to green. Remote control changes the indi indicator light from red to green. Which electromagnetic waves are used in these actions? Sorry, which electromagnetic waves used in this action has the lowest wavelength? Do not forget that um, satellite communication is done by radio waves, okay? And um, the remote control uses infrared rays. Why this one you can see, the red and green light you can see, they are visible rays of light. And the electromagnetic spectrum is as follows. We have radio waves. We have microwaves, we have um, infrared rays, we have visible light, we have ultraviolet rays, we have um, x-rays, and then we have gamma rays. So the one that has the highest frequency is gamma rays, but it has the lowest wavelength. Why the one that has the lowest frequency is radio waves, but it has the highest wavelength. Which one has the highest wavelength? 
Longest wavelength means highest wavelength, and that will be radio waves. And that is where we have satellite communication. Satellite communication uses radio waves, okay? Radio wave has the longest wavelength and lowest frequency. This one is visible light, okay? The visible light you can see with your eyes, that's this. And the one that is infrared, um, the most control use infrared rays for communication. So you must, love, you must have lens communication in your physics um, coursework. Number 23, a sound has a wavelength of 0 0.024 meters. What is the frequency of this sound wave? And is it audible to human? Well, well, you know, the frequency of human, the human can hear from, human can hear frequency from 0 to 20 kilohertz. That's 20,000 hertz. So if this is the, if this is the wavelength, and you know the speed of light is around them 330 meters per second. It's around 330 to 340 meters per second. So let us use 330. We divide the speed by the, uh, okay, let's see. Velocity is frequency multiplied by wavelength. So how do we get frequency? Frequency is um, velocity divided by wavelength. Let us divide the velocity by wavelength, okay? If you divide the velocity by wavelength, you get frequency. Frequency is speed divided by wavelength. And with speed of sound, let us pick 330 meters per second. And the wavelength is what we have here, 0 0.024. 0 0.024. Let's divide those two and see if we get a good um, value. 330 divided by 0 0.024. This gives us around them um, 13,750, which is approximately 14,000. So we pick 14,000 um, hertz. And this is audible to human. This is audible to human because human can hear frequencies that are within um, the 0 to 20 kilohertz range. And this 14 kilohertz is audible to human. That makes that the correct answer. Option C, the correct answer to question number 23. Now we go straight to question 24. Question 24 says, the diagram shows a bar magnet at rest on a smooth horizontal surface. So you have a bar magnet on a smooth horizontal surface. A length of soft iron wire is held parallel to the magnet. So you have a um, soft iron parallel to the magnet. They are beside each other. The wire is released. Now when you leave this wire, what happens to this wire? Do not forget it is iron, and iron is a magnetic material. What happens? Number one, the wire moves away from the magnet. No, the wire moves towards the magnet. Correct. The magnet will attract the wire to itself. That's good enough. No need considering the other option. Question 25. The man walks across a carpet. He becomes negatively charged by friction with the carpet. So if the man is gaining negative charges, what does that mean? It means some electrons have... have have um, attached themselves to the man. Now, what happens as it, touch, as it touches a metal object connected to the earth? If it touches a metal object, then the electrons that have gathered themselves to him will be transferred to the metal object. That's all. So the man gains electron. No, the man loses electron. Yes, electrons will be transferred from the man's body to the metal surface. That's good enough. Question 25, 26. A laboratory has a standard wire of known resistance. It also has other wires made from the same material as the standard wire, but of different lengths and diameters. Which wire would definitely have a resistance of less than the standard wire? Well, um, for you to have less resistance, you know, the formula for resistance is um, resistivity, resistivity multiplied by length divided by area, okay? Or you say, or you can use some books use this symbol for resistivity. Resistivity multiplied by length divided by area. In fact, most books use this symbol for resistivity. So for you to have a um, higher resistance, okay, less resistance rather. So for you to have lower resistance, that means the length must be lower, okay. The length must be lower, then the area will be higher. That is the reason why fat and short conductors are known to have low resistance, while narrow and long
conductors are known to have higher resistance. So the short and larger wire, the short and larger one, that will be the correct answer to question 26. Question 27. The diagram shows a circuit. Which energy transfer occurs? You know, the battery contains chemical energy, right? So energy in the battery will be converted to electrical energy. And when that energy gets to the lamp, what happens? The electrical energy in the lamp will be converted to light energy and heat, which will be transferred into the air, into the surrounding air. And that's what we have here. Energy in the battery transfers to the lamp and from the lamp to the surrounding air. Option A is the correct answer to question 27. We go straight to question 28 that says, X, Y, and Z and lamps. This is a lamp, this is a lamp, this is a lamp. In which lamps is there current? Can there be current here? Do not forget this is direct current. This is a transformer. Transformer cannot transmit direct current. Hence, there will be no current in the lamp. This is a direct current. This is a variable resistor. This is a lamp. Of course, there will be current here because current will flow in the circuit. All are DC components. This is direct current. This is a... Um, this is a photoresistive material. That means when there is light, the resistance will reduce. When there is no light, resistance increases. But there will always be resistance in the material. Okay, and this is a voltage source. Hence, there will also be current in material Z, in a lamp Z. So Y and Z, there will be current in Y and Z. That means option C, the correct answer. There will be no lamp. There will be no current in X. Why there will be current in Y and Z? Question 29. The diagram shows a circuit. Which change occurs, sorry, which change causes the bulb in the circuit to become brighter? How will you increase the brightness of this bulb? Um, a decrease in light intensity. This has no, light has no effect on this. A decrease in temperature, no. An increase in light intensity, no. An increase in temperature. When you are increasing the temperature, the resistance of this material can drop and that will um, cause an increase in current okay because when this resistance reduces v equal to i r v equals to i r okay so when resistance is reducing sorry so current will be v over r yeah so when the denominator is reducing when resistance is reducing then the value of the total fraction will increase hence the current that will flow in the circuit will be higher when resistance drops the total resistance will be considered to be less, lesser than original value, and that will increase the current in the circuit. Question 30. The current in the kettle is 10 amperes, and the kettle is protected by a 13 amperes fuse. The owner of the kettle replaces the 13 amperes fuse with a 3 amperes fuse. What happens when the kettle is switched on? You know, the function of a fuse is to is to cause what is to limit the current flowing in in a circuit. That's what fuses do. They limit the current flowing in a circuit. So once this fuse breaks, once the wire in this in the fuse cuts, okay. So let me just draw what that can look like. When this wire cuts, what will it look like? It looks like this. This will be the beginning of the wire. This will be the end of the wire. Okay. There will be no continuity. There will be no continuity between these two ends and when that happens current cannot flow okay so the fuse will melt when higher current when current are higher than the value of its rating it is rated three amps the new fuse is rated three amps so when current of 13 amps comes the fuse will break and once it breaks or melts what happens the fuse melts and the kettle might be damaged no it won't be damaged the fuse melts and the kettle is undamaged yes the kettle will be protected okay why diffuse melt question 31 a wire is moved down in the direction perpendicular to the magnetic field so we have this wire this magnetic field magnetic lines of force they run from the north pole to the south pole so this direction of magnetic lines of force now when you move the wire in in a direction perpendicular to the magnetic field, what happens? There will be a current flowing in the wire. Three changes are suggested. Number one, the speed of sorry. The wire is moved in a direction perpendicular to the magnetic field. Three changes are sub suggested. Number one, the speed of movement of the wire is increased. The magnetic field strength is decreased. The direction of magnetic field strength is reversed. 
which changes increases the electromotive force induced in the wire. Reversing the direction does not change the strength. Magnetic field strength decreasing will reduce the electromotive force. So it's only number one that increases the, yeah, like when you increase the speed of movement, then you are increasing the induced electromotive force. That makes B the correct answer to question 31. Question 32. In an experiment, a wire is held above a compass needle as shown. An electric current is switched on in the wire and the compass needle is deflected. If the wire deflects this compass needle, then it automatically means the wire is being induced with an, with an um, electromagnetic, that the wire becomes an electromagnet. That's what it means for it to, defle for it to deflect this compass needle. You no, know, this compass needle is a magnet itself. It has a north pole and a south pole. Okay, so let's see. Which row explains why this happens and then describe what happens when the current is reversed? Why is this happening? There is a magnetic field inside the wire. A magnetic field cannot exist in the wire. It is not an electron. There is a magnetic field inside the wire. No, there is a magnetic field around the wire. Yes, a magnetic field is created around the wire. And then the compass needle deflects in the opposite direction. So when you reverse the direction of the current, the compass needle will deflect in the opposite direction. That makes C the correct option to the answer to the question. Question 33. Over time, the strength of the magnets in the electric motor decreases. Which hole gives two ways to keep the motor running at its original speed? Yeah, when you reduce, when the strength of the magnetic field reduces, the force will reduce, okay? Why? Because force is equal to B I L. That's magnetic field strength, the current, and the length. You get it? Good. So how will you keep the keep the motor running at constant speed? So if this force reduces, what what can you do to try to increase this force? Either you increase the magnetic field strength, you increase the current flowing in the in the in the um, coil, or you increase the length probably by increasing the number of turns. Okay, good. So which role? to keep the motor running at its original speed. So you increase magnetic field strength, increase the current, or increase the length. How do you increase length? By increasing the number of turns, adding more turns to the wire. So to decrease current in coil, no. Decrease, no. Increase current and decrease number of turns, no. Increase current and increase number of turns. Correct. That makes B the correct answer to question 33. Question 34. A rechargeable battery contains lithium. The lithium exists as positive lithium ions. How does an ion of lithium differ from an atom of lithium? You know, lithium has atomic number of three. Okay, so that will be lithium plus. Okay, hydrogen, helium, lithium. Lithium is the number three on the electro in the um, periodic table, and it has um yeah, it has oxidation number of plus one. Why this is the lithium atom? lithium atom okay good so the ion has fewer electrons that's correct this is the ion the ion has them um, fewer electrons because when this atom when this atom loses an electron once an electron leaves this atom what happens it becomes this ion so the ion is an atom that has lost an electron that's all okay so the ion has fewer electrons orbiting the nucleus that's correct so that makes the correct answer to question 34 to be, to be A, yeah. Or go through B, the ion has more elect the ion has more electron. No, the nucleus of the ion has less charge. Of course not. Nucleus does not have charges. The nucleus of the ion is more positively charged. Please, let's ignore that. Transfer of electrons is not from the nucleus, it's from the shell, okay? So then let's, don't just look at the nucleus. So an ion, sorry, an ion nuclide is represented by the symbol, this ion nuclide. Which statement about the nucleus of ion nuclide is correct? Okay, the nucleus contains 56 electrons. No, this is not the number of electrons. This is the atomic number, which is the number of electrons. Or number, I know the number of proton equals number of electrons because it is an... Um, is an atom, not an ion. So, um, 
mass number is number of proton plus number of neutron okay so the mass number is 56 the number of proton is 26 we don't have the number of neutron that means the number of neutron will be 56 minus 26 why when you take this 26 to the other side it becomes minus 26 so you have 56 minus 26 we give you n that means the number of neutron will be 30 good so we have um um 26 proton 30 neutron the mass number is 56 which explains um about a nucleus of ion nuclide are correct the nucleus contains 56 electrons no 56 neutrons no the nucleon number is 30 that's correct the proton number is 26 that's correct two and three are correct that makes option c the correct answer to question 35. question 36 what is an artificial source of background radiation x-ray machine is hospital no sorry what is an artificial source yes this is artificial because the machine is man-made all others carbon gas from rocks that's natural um background radiation cosmic ray from sun is natural from the um, you know the big bang theory plants and other living things of course that's also natural background radiation question 37 a sample of radioactive isotope has an initial rate of emission of 128 count per minute and you have life of four days how long will it take the rate of emission to fall to 32 counts per minute you know initially we have 128 counts per minute right and the half life is four days that means after four days we have um considering the half life divide 128 by 2 we have 64. okay that will be after four days let's use color red to represent the number of days after four days we have 64 left after another four days after another four days so we have another half let's divide 64 by 2 we have 32 okay so after another four days 32. after another four days again you see divided 32 by 2 you have 16 but we don't need that because what we are interested is in how long does it take for us to have 32 left and that will be 4 plus 4 that will be 8 days yeah after four days we have 64 left after another four days we have 32 left so how long will it take you to have 32 left that will be four days plus four days which is eight days that makes question c the correct answer to question 37 we go straight to question 38 question 38 says an approximately low sorry approximately how long does it take for the moon to make one complete orbit of the earth of course that is very easy that will be what that will be one month Yes, it takes the moon one month to move around the Earth, okay? And the rotation of the Earth about its axis, it takes 24 hours or one day. The sun has a mass of 2.0 times 10 to 30 kilograms. Which elements account for most of this mass? What are the elements in the mass? Hydrogen. Yes, that's the fuel. That's the fuel in the mass. Hydrogen. The, the mass, sorry, it doesn't say mass. That's the fuel in the sun. Hydrogen. All the, all the energy coming from the sun is coming from radioactivity coming from when two hydrogen and nuclide fuse together to form a, a helium nuclide so the the what is accounting for that mass is hydrogen yes that's the main thing okay so if there was helium there of course when the hydrogen fuse together they form helium if there was helium there or hydrogen and helium yes you can add helium to it but number one is hydrogen that is fusing together and the last question in this series, uh, in this um, question paper, the nearest star to the sun is Proxima Centauri at a distance of 4.2 light years. Which statements are correct? You know, 4.2 light years is refers to the distance traveled by light in 4.2 years. You know, the distance traveled by light in one second. In one second, light travels a distance of 300 million meters. Okay, light travels 300 million meter, meters in one second. That means light will travel 3 billion meters in 10 seconds. In 10 seconds, light will travel 3 billion meters. Now, imagine how long light will travel in an hour. Imagine how long light will travel in one month. Now, imagine how long light will travel in one year. Let's talk of this 4.2 years. So that is a very long distance. That means this, this um, star is far away from our solar system okay so a telescope image of proxima centauri show it as it was 4.2 years ago yes 
Yes, that means this simply means there will be a delay of 4.2 years for light rays coming from from Proxima Centauri to get to the Earth, our planet. It will take 4.2 years. That means if, you, if a photographer uses a telescope to capture the image of that um, star, the, the image you are seeing is exactly the way the star was 4.2 years ago. Not exactly the way the star is right now. So some changes might have taken place in that star. That star might even have exploded and no longer be in existence currently. So if a spacecraft near Proxima Centauri sends a radio message to the Earth, it will take 4.2 years to arrive. Yes, because the light will be traveling, the rays will be traveling, um, sorry, the radio message will be traveling at the speed of light and, and it will be delayed by 4.2 years because that star is 4.2 years away from the Earth. Then the third one, Proxima Centauri is outside the Milky Way. How can we determine? whether it's outside the Milky Way. What is the radius of the Milky Way? Let's assume this is the Milky Way. The diameter of the Milky Way is 100,000 light years, okay? So that means the radius of the Milky Way would be 50,000 light years. 50,000 light years. And our own um, solar system is as 27,000 light years from the center of the from the center of our world from the center of our own galaxy okay sorry our solar system is 27,000 light years from the center of our, our milky way galaxy that means our solar system should be around here. Now, we've been told that um, from here to here, you have 27,000 light years. Now, we've been told that this, the planet is just um, 4.2 light years away. If this is um, 27,000, that means 4.2 should be around. Let me just use a different color to represent the planet. The planet should be around here. Okay? The planet should be around here. Okay? Or around here. Very close to our solar system. So that means it's still within our Milky Way galaxy. You understand that? It's clear, right? Good. Good. So it's still within. So Proxima Centauri is outside our Milky Way galaxy. No, it's not outside our Milky Way galaxy. It's within our Milky Way galaxy. Because our Milky Way galaxy, our galaxy, the galaxy is very wide, okay? And the Milky Way is just um, 27,000 light years away from the center of the galaxy. So, which one is correct? Only one and two are correct. That makes me the correct answer to question 40. It brings us to the end of um, 2023. Um, Physics 0625 IGCSC February March series. This question paper was released today. And this video was made today. Ensure you study this video because this is the latest curriculum. Yes, ensure you study this very well and make sure you stay tuned and watch other videos. This is the latest curriculum and it's very likely other questions, your exams, all exams using this curriculum will be in this um, format, in this pattern. So ensure you watch other videos in this series. And the, this curriculum runs from 2023 to 2025. So this, this video will definitely be valid for that period. Do have a nice day. Stay tuned for the next video. Goodbye.